awfully loud. Welcome. Uh, let's go ahead and begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, light of the world, we give you thanks that you have brought us into your light and you've brought us out of the darkness that surrounds us. Lord, continue to enlighten us with your word and through your spirit. Open our hearts and our minds to receive this word and to understand these things we ask, knowing you give our answers to our prayers through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, well, I debated a little bit on where to start. I've got us on the slide where we sort of ended up last week, which was talking about the Sadducees um, challenging Jesus on the subject of marriage. Um, but, and I, I didn't ask permission to do this, but I got a phone call this last week after Bible class let out from a member who had asked a couple of questions about, you know, this business of the resurrection from the dead. And specifically, they asked about the event of the transfiguration. And um, they said, well, who was there at the transfiguration? You guys remember? Yeah. yeah. So it was Moses and Elijah were present at the transfiguration. And the question was, were they in body? How were they recognized was the question. And I thought, ah, <laughs> this means we're going to trudge through this one on Sunday. When I wanted to trudge in marriage. <laughs> and my, my wife's here now, so I can trudge through our marriage with you guys. No, I'm kidding. So I, I did a little looking, and I have to say, I, was, I didn't have a lot of time this last week because I had a funeral to do yesterday and services on Wednesday. And after the call came, I was prepping some other stuff. And, and so I didn't get as far on it as I had liked or as I would have liked. But um, suffice it to say that I did not find an answer to that particular question in any of the commentaries that I searched. And I really felt like I had a pretty good handle on it, um, given the one commentator who was the guy that preached at my installation here, and he's usually pretty thorough on these things. But uh, I'll, I'll tell you that I did search his commentaries and a few others that he recommends, and I found no word on this. And I'm a bit surprised because Dr. Gibbs, that preached here at my installation, is really big on the resurrection of the body. That's kind of his um, hobby horse that he's always, or the ax that he's always grinding on with us as students, was to impress upon us the reality of the, the resurrection of the body. And um, so I was a bit surprised to find it. But then I have to tell you, I, I also, in part of the discussion that we began, and this is where these two, I felt like, intersected a little bit in his commentary. Um, when we were talking about the subject of marriage, I was reading in his commentary. He's got a three-volume work on Matthew. And... Um, yeah, can you imagine writing just one of these? And he wrote three of them, and he did it in the course of just a few years. So it's, uh, he's, a, he's a stud. <laughs> but this is what I got. I first want to read you the story just to get our minds aright on um, the story of the Sadducees challenging Jesus. This is nearing the end of Jesus' public ministry. It's in Matthew 22, if you want to follow along. And I'm going to pick up at verse 23. The same day, Sadducees came to him who say there is no resurrection. So if you know nothing about the Sadducees, that's sort of a key piece. They just deny the resurrection from the dead. You'll hear in his commentary that um, you read a lot of commentators on uh, the business of the resurrection of the dead, and you'll see a remarkable amount of consistency amongst commentators that say there's very little evidence for resurrection from the dead that comes from the Old Testament, which would explain why Old Testament scholars or you know, Jewish rabbis, for instance, might struggle with this idea or why there may be a group like the Sadducees. Yes? I worked with a Jewish man quite many years ago, and he, they, he, whatever part of the Jewish religion he was with, they didn't believe in, in life. So, yeah, you know, you may find that in, in Jews of, of now. Yeah you know, that even carry through with the same belief. I find that a little bit interesting because, you know, there's this push for Jews to be buried on a specific mountain, you know, so that when the resurrection happens, there'll be those who are there buried on the mountain in Palestine will be raised. I asked him about it, you know, what, yeah. what actually do you believe? And he said, well, your life on earth is what counts, and when you're dead, you're dead. 
Was he, was he a Jew? Was he an ethnic Jew or was he a religious Jew? He was both ethnic and religious as a Jew. Okay. Yes, Susan. So what they believe is not a bodily resurrection, but they would still perhaps recognize a spiritual. This guy said when you were dead, you were dead. And there's no afterlife. There's no time with. Wow, sitting on a park bench. I'm just telling you, I got my sights set higher than that. But. But what, I mean, I guess what's the point of the Messiah coming to get them if there's no bodily resurrection? showed his favor on you when you were here on earth. And so the more prosperous you are on earth, the more God So favors. Jewish prosperity gospel is basically yes. what it is. Yes. If you're if the you're more, favored the more favored you are and if you've got you know you're got problems then God yeah. no favor. So their point of living here on earth was to, to gain God's to maximize favor the favor of God, yeah. Before yeah. their life here on earth and then when their life was done it was yeah, you know, it really fits, I guess as you're explaining it, she says basically what it is is like a Jewish prosperity gospel, that God shows his love to you while you're still alive on this earth. He blesses you, you know, manifold blessings in this life so that you can enjoy this life. And then at the end of this life, there's no awareness of any existence beyond this life, which I would say, you know, that's sort of, in a way, it's comforting. But you guys know the old adage, I probably told you about this before, you remember, um, Linus and Lucy and Peanuts cartoon, you know, and Lucy would sit with the psychiatric help for a nickel in a little, in a little thing like that. I saw a cartoon one time that had two booths like that. One of them had a big lineup of people lined all the way back off of the, off of the picture, off of the page. The other one was sitting empty. The one who was sitting empty said, um, the cold hard truth, a nickel, or for free. And the other one said, uh, comforting lies, a dollar. <laughs> that had the big lineup. So people were willing, are willing to go and pay for these comforting lies, you know, so that they can be told these things and, and feel like, well, you know, it's kind of good. Like this atheist that I sat and listened to the panel at the LWML convention one time when they invited a panel uh, full of atheists, six atheists to come and talk about why they had become atheists, some who had left the faith. So I sat in and I listened to this whole thing, you know, with great interest. And, um, you know, some of the things they said made logical sense to me. So for instance, one of them said, uh, you know, they were asked, what do you believe is going to happen to you when you die? And they said, um, we believe that you didn't exist. And then you do exist and you have an awareness of your existence. And then when you die, you no longer exist and you have no awareness of it. And I'm like, well, that's sort of a comforting lie. Um, if you measure that against scripture, because the scriptures tell us that there is an awareness. I mean, Jesus says today you will be with me in paradise, to a guy who was clearly that same day not going to last the day, right? So we, we either take Jesus at his word or we reject Jesus at his word. And I would say when it comes to a Jew, I mean, that's one of the hallmarks of a Jew is that they reject Jesus as Messiah, so they don't take Jesus as his word, at his word. They would look to the Old Testament and specifically to the Torah or the Pentateuch, the, the first five books of the Bible, and that's what Back to, on track, here's kind of what Gibbs is talking about. He says, you know, there's sort of precious little in the way of commentators talking about the, the life after death, the resurrection from the dead, the bodily resurrection from the dead, evident in the Old Testament scriptures. And then he says, but that's what commentators say, and I'm not one of them commentators. <laughs> and I'll, I'll give you some samples from his reading, but I, I want to carry on with the story here. 
I said carry on a third time, fourth time now. Ding dong. <laughs> Ding dong. <laughs> I could have had a V8. Um, at the same time, Sadducees came to Jesus, who say there is no resurrection. They asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses said if a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up the children for his brother. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first married and died having no children, left his wife to his brother. So the second and the third down to the seventh. After them all, the woman died. In the resurrection, therefore, of the seven, whose wife will she be? For they all had her. Jesus answered them, You are wrong because you neither know the scriptures nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was said to you by God, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. Um, Jesus cites from Exodus chapter 3, which is the burning bush. Okay? So, where I said the question that was posed to me about, you know, Moses and Abraham present with Jesus at the transfiguration, were they there in body, were they there in soul, how were they recognized, and I found no joy when I was doing some looking through the commentaries to find something on this. This does, however, take us to Moses, okay? And so this was as close of an answer to that question that still sort of perplexes me, and that, by the way, Dr. Gibbs and his wife will be here in April camping at Bull Shoals Park. And so, uh, and we're supposed to get together with him, so I'm carrying a list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually thought about inviting him to come, you know, talk to the class maybe, but he's retired and he's on vacation. I, yeah, I know, that's what I said. We gotta, we'll have a book sale. Well, he doesn't get any royalties off of this through CPH, so... Um, if somebody were watching Jesus ascend to heaven, would they have known who he was? Well, his, his fame, I mean, word of Jesus got around. Think about just the, I mean, simply like the feeding of the 5,000. And that was just, that was just the men counted in the crowd, not counting the women, the children, and all the, you know, the sort of stragglers that were following on. This guy in, in an ancient time when he didn't have the internet, you didn't have to buy tickets to go see one of his shows. You didn't have a cell phone to pass word along. Word of mouth was traveling about this guy. People, he had raised a ruckus. So much so that the governor, right, Pontius Pilate, was aware of it and was worried about it and was worried about his own job. So he had to put this guy to death and try and quell this movement that Jesus had started so that word of it wouldn't get back to Rome. So you're tracking on sort of the answer that I gave was, you know, God is God. That was another one of my professors that used to say that. And I never really thought about the, the poignancy of what he was saying. But if God wants to have Moses and Elijah standing there in front of, you know, Peter, James, and John on the Mount of Transfiguration, God can have Moses and Elijah standing there with them. You know, and that, that's sort of an unfulfilling answer for us, you know, and and by the way, this sort of that business God is God and you are not is a reminder to us always and forever that we are creature and not God. What was the first sin that Adam and Eve entered into? They wanted to be like God, which meant they had to have all the answers. They had to know everything. And that's sort of forever our curse, isn't it, in our humanity? is It's not a curse to be in our humanity. I, I want to be careful about maybe being mistaken for saying something like that. But that's part of the curse, is that in our humanity, we're not going to have the answers to everything. That's for God to know. And as creatures, it's our job to sort of be content with that. All right, Lord, this is what you've given me, and I'm content with that. They would have had to have been some, maybe not body like this, but I mean, they had to have been in some form that they were recognized. They were in a form that they were recognized, but, but get this. Moses and Elijah didn't live in the same era that Peter, James, and John did. So how is it that they know these guys 
they know them to be these guys who are full-on strangers. My answer to the person that asked about it was, if you read, I believe it's Luke's account of the whole thing, um, it speaks of the conversation they were having. And in the Greek text, it says they were talking to Jesus. In the Greek text, it says about his departure. The Greek word is his exodus. So, you know, you can sort of make a link with the word that they're speaking to Jesus about his departure. What's Jesus' departure? His death, his crucifixion. So they're literally there on the mountain talking to Jesus about his upcoming crucifixion that's going to happen when he goes to Jerusalem. And that word exodus, I think Luke is sort of a craftsman in his gospel, and he, he makes it so that we can go, ah, exodus. You know, like you, you think exodus, what do you think of exodus? You think Moses. Moses wrote the book of exodus. What's the book of exodus about? It's about the people of Israel you know, leaving, leaving Egypt. So, you know, I, maybe they had name tags. Wear your name tags in church so that we know who you are. But, but I would offer, you know, towards the end of all of this discussion here and sort of speculation is that if God wants us to recognize somebody like that, he's going to have us recognize them. This is a bad example, but it just sort of came to mind, and maybe I should just keep it to myself, but... <laughs> but I can't, is that what you said? I know. <laughs> so let me share it with you. <laughs> um, Amy and I, when we started dating, um, her grandfather was sick. And um, Amy left to, to go to Walt Disney World to work when we first started dating. And then I stayed back. And her grandmother, when she was, her grandfather, when she is gone at Disney, um, passed away. My folks happened to be in Orlando on a conference when he died. But towards the end, he was very sick and he was in his bed. And he would be and you guys will resonate with this because many of you have experiences like this. He, he would lay in his bed in his sickness and he would recognize angels, the people dressed in white that were there to see him. He would recognize people that would come and comfort him you know, in his sickness and in his illness. And to me, I don't have an explanation for that. I don't know how it goes. I don't know exactly what the Lord has in store, why he gives sort of that peaceful understanding at the last, like that with somebody. But to me, it makes sense that the Lord would, would send you know, people. That, and you hear this about near-death experiences all the time when you read books on near-death experience. People see ones that they love, people that give them comfort. Are those apparitions of people that they love? Are those actually you know, you know, the sort of interim state people greeting them so that they're recognizable? But, but nonetheless, the case that I'm trying to get at here is that there's some... Someone who is recognizable that brings, puts them at ease. And, and so if we can recognize somebody in a near-death experience, if we can recognize somebody when we're on our deathbed like that, like that example, um, it stands to reason then that the Lord can give recognition to a Moses or an Elijah you know, on the Mount of Transfiguration, right? In the same way, he can withhold recognition like he did with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, or with the women, you know, you know, don't grab onto me, Rabboni. You know, I see you're my teacher. So I think I think it's possible for God to do whatever He wants, and I think we need to sort of settle our minds that if God wants to do this, He can. God can do whatever He wants to do. He's God. I'm not, and it's my job just to receive the things. And that sounds it sounds sort of condescending, and I don't want it to sound condescending. Oh, God wants to do this; He can do it. Well, who are you to speak about it? And that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying, you know, God, God's going to act in a way he's going to act. And rather than, you know, question the text and go, well, and I don't think that's even the case, making it sound as if it's sort of unsanctified and questioning the text. I think it's fair to question the text because we wonder about some of these things. And, and um, you know, then a lot of people, what they do when they get that is they go, well, on that day, I'm going to walk up to God. I'm going to ask why this and why that. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're just going to be so happy that you're there, that it's all settled now and we don't have to ask. And, and they, the person didn't say that either. So don't let me put words in their mouth. But. So we've got the story of Jesus and the Sadducees, and we know that the Sadducees challenge him, and they say, hey, there is no resurrection. And then Jesus, drawing from Old Testament history that they would have been well familiar with, from Exodus 3, the story of the burning bush, Moses, the story of the burning bush. Do you remember that? Should we look at that one real quick, just so we have it? Probably, before I read some of this. So back to Exodus. It's a Bible study. I don't feel bad about making you look at your Bibles. 
All right. So Moses 3, or Moses 3, Exodus 3, starting at <laughs> verse 1. Um, now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro down by the cement pond, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock on the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire and out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, and yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, he said, here I am. He said, do not come near, take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. So there's the text that Jesus refers to. Now you've got to know that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were long gone, long dead by the time God speaks of them, you know, to, to um, Moses. But he makes himself known, and you've heard me say this before, like how you know the difference between a true prophet and a false prophet. A true prophet, what he says happens, comes true. False prophet, what he says doesn't happen, doesn't come true. And God, in such in allowing that to happen with his prophets, God, if you read the Old Testament at any length, you'll see God is always referring to things that he's done or people that he's associated with. So I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God who brought you out of Egypt as on eagle's wings. And God is constantly reminding people, I did this, I did that, I did the other. And in so doing, reinforcing who he is with people by what he has done. Okay, that way he can be recognized. Well, here's what Gibbs says about Jesus referring to this well-known Exodus story. And I'm going to give you some excerpts. I tried to mark all of them. There's a bunch. And I, I realize that how difficult it is to be read to, so I apologize for that. But let me do my best with this. The Sadducees' question does not come from any real desire to know the truth about the resurrection and whose wife will she be. It has nothing to do with them asking the question in the way that they did it. For they say that there will be no resurrection at all. Jesus now fronts the more fundamental question, namely, whether God's plan for humanity includes reversal of death, and specifically, whether the scriptures of Israel teach this goal. You with me so far? The Messiah's answer is, of course, positive. Yes, the Old Testament teaches the resurrection of people who are rightly called the dead. The scriptural basis for Jesus' claim is the account of the burning bush in Exodus 3. It cannot be denied, however, that the scripture cited by Jesus is somewhat unexpected, and that the exegetical reasoning that Jesus employs is elliptical and requires some unfolding. And then he states, commentators usually go one of two ways, and one way he rejects. He says, I, we can't accept that, because the reasoning that they employ is is circular and it actually disproves what they're trying to prove by it. So I'm going to spare you that part and I'll give you sort of his answer or part of his answer in a couple of ways here. He says, in the, as far as I've been able to de determine, early Judaism did not commonly view the patriarchs as still alive in the way that commentators routinely claim. So he says, um, and you guys got to understand how commentary works, maybe, before I carry on. Let's carry on. It's like, a, it's like a thing that's stuck up there now. I can't get rid of it. People that write commentaries will, will give you a bibliography of all the works that they read. And when they come across something that's difficult or troubling, they look to what other commentators write about it. They do their own work. And in the case of you know, people that write an exegetical commentary, they translate the language, and Gibbs is, is an exegete by nature, so he's reading the language, and he's real big on drawing out of the language, because God is in the verbs, is what they used to tell us all the time, right? So he's read a lot about this in other commentators to formulate an understanding. He says, I found references to this understanding in only two sources from early Judaism. Even more significantly, for Maccabees and Philo, the two sources that do articulate this view are sources which apparently do not accept the resurrection of the body. So these are extra-biblical, pseudepigraphal works. I've had pseudepigraphal books up in front of you guys I've read before. And he says, 
early Judaism didn't commonly view patriarchs alive, and the ones that did deny the resurrection. Right? So, as such, four Maccabees and Philo should scarcely be used to flesh out an understanding of Jesus' logic. Then he moves to, how should we understand the logic of Jesus' teaching, whereby he rebuts the Sadducees? The text invites us to keep our focus on the fact that the resurrection of the body is intrinsically about the future. Indeed, and then he goes, get this, he goes to the grammar because he's an exegete. He says, the present indicatives of the text generally offer a futuristic sense. How many grammarians do we have in the room? Yeah. Do you guys know what an indicative is? You know present tense, you know past tense, present tense, future tense. What's a present indicative? It points to something. Right, very good. So he says, I suggest that the logic of Jesus' answer should work like this. Concerning the resurrection of the dead, and he's got three simple points. And this is what I want you to take away. Point one, from Matthew 22, verse 31. The God of Israel is the God of the patriarchs who are among the dead. The patriarchs, just like in the Old Testament, right, where Moses is confronted by God in the burning bush, and he says, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they're long dead, right? So the patriarchs are among the dead. That's point one. Point two, this God is not the God of the dead, but the God of those who are living. That's Jesus' words in verse 32 of chapter 22. So he says that he's the God of these people, and we know, logically speaking, they're dead, but God says they're not dead. He says he's the God of the living, right? So we take him at his word. And then point three, therefore, this God shall surely raise the dead including the patriarchs. Because they're not the dead. He calls them the living. Now, if they're, if they're clearly dead and they're gone, and this was something I did with the, the person who called me the other day. Uh, can you guys find the book Jude in your Bible? Yeah, it's like a page. Yeah. Let's look up Jude. I'm going to see if I can do it. You, you with your electronic Bibles, that's cheating. <laughs> Come on. There we go. Now I'll double check it to make sure that I'm right. So we we're talking about Moses. You know, how did Moses not die? became one of the questions in that conversation. Well, maybe Moses didn't die, but what we know is that Moses made it right up to the bank of the Jordan River, and then he gave his long, long sermon, Deuteronomy, and everybody fell asleep while they were listening to the long sermon, Deuteronomy, and then Moses was not allowed to cross over the Jordan into the Promised Land. So we know that he died there. It says his eye, he died at 120 years of age, his eye was undimmed, it says. Okay? Look at Jude, specifically Jude verse 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. Wait, what? The body of Moses? See, the question was, well, maybe Moses didn't really die. Yet the text tells us that Moses really died in the book of Deuteronomy. Wait, if Moses wrote Deuteronomy, how do we get the word in there that he died? Did he write about his own death? Well, it's presumed that Joshua, you know, if you read commentaries on this stuff, it's presumed that Joshua finished the end of the book to tell the end of Moses' story. But what we know is that Moses died. The scriptures attest to it. And we have the testimony of Jude here that his body remained and that the devil bargained weird as it may sound, with the archangel Michael for the body of Moses. So we know that Moses was dead, was buried, even like the patriarchs that went before him, right? But the logic and the reasoning that we're understanding right here is that Jesus employing this logic is, I'm not the God of the dead, but I'm the God of the living. And even though they die, yet shall they live. And It'll be proven out to you in my own resurrection. So I've asked this question before. How are people in the New Testament saved? In New Testament times saved? 
How are you saved? By faith. You need to be baptized? No. You can be saved without baptism, but presumably if you're in the faith and you're reading the Word, which gives faith, what you're going to find in the Word is that you should be baptized because baptism is a command of God, right? So be baptized, right? You don't have to be, though. Do you have to commune to be saved? No, you don't, okay? Because you could potentially commune to your damnation, which wouldn't save you if you were communing incorrectly. What you need to be saved is you need faith. Now, what faith informs you is, as you read, you would take communion because it would be salvific for you. It's good for the forgiveness of sins. It's good for the nourishment of the soul, right? And for increasing faith. So you should desire it. Although there are times that, I don't know if you guys are like me, maybe you've done a little self-examination on occasion and you've thought, you know, maybe today's not the right day to commune. I'm not in the right frame of mind. And that's not bad. It's not wrong. All you need to be saved is faith. So in the New Testament era, our era, on backwards, you are saved by faith in what? In Jesus' work on your behalf. You're not saved by faith in faith. You guys might be surprised to learn Luther wrote a whole book on this. It's called, the, well, it's not a book necessarily. It was called the Heidelberg Disputation of 1519. And I wrote a whole Lenten series on the Heidelberg Disputation. Someday I may unleash it on you. <laughs> and you guys will learn about the Heidelberg Disputation of 1519. Good stuff in there. And he says, if you have faith in your faith, be careful. Because that faith is your good work and it's to your damnation. What? You have faith in Christ and Christ's work for you. You don't have faith in the amount of faith that you have. You have faith in what Christ has done for you. You're going to interrupt me and I'm not going to finish my point. But it's okay. <laughs> well, go ahead. What does damnation mean? Damnation means separation from God. Well, I think when it crosses, you know, the difference between a forgivable sin and an unforgivable sin, there's only one unforgivable sin according to the Scriptures. What's that? It's persistent rejection of the work of God's Holy Spirit. What's God's Holy Spirit's work? That's the one everybody knows, is working faith in us. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. This, not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast. Who is responsible? God's Holy Spirit, given to us through hearing the word or through the waters of holy baptism, works faith in us, and that faith is salvific for us. Everybody knows that that's the work of the Holy Spirit. There's another work of the Holy Spirit. That's his proper work we just identified. What's his alien work? To condemn, to convict the world according to sin. So, persistent rejection of God's Holy Spirit. Let's use the atheist example from before. The atheist who rejects that there is a God or there is a Holy Spirit who is a part of the triune God who works conviction, the atheist can go, I have no conviction. I have no sin. I'm fine. I'm good. Right? There's no spirit working in them because they're rejecting God's Holy Spirit. They're not listening to God's Holy Spirit. Where a sin goes from damnable... You can be damned for this. Where it crosses the line is when you reject that it's a sin. This is the danger that I think we persistently live in under our current times is that people, you know, they sin and they sin manifestly and they don't care that it's a sin because they get to be the determinant of what is a sin rather than let God and his word be a determinant of what is sin. So people are shocked when they hear me say something as simple as, you know, missing the Sabbath, missing church on the Sabbath is a sin and it's damnable because you have to reject God's Holy Spirit and you have to reject God and His Word that says that you should remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. And skipping even one is damnable and everybody goes, no, well, it's okay. Well, if I'm sick or what if I'm on the road traveling? And you know, they've got all kinds of excuses and God doesn't want your excuses. God wants you to understand that He's spoken on this matter and it's a damnable sin. Now, can we seek forgiveness for these things? Yes. God works contrition and repentance in our hearts. He, through his power of his Holy Spirit, turns our hearts from their darkness 
and their sin that they're ever having a proclivity towards, and he turns us towards the light again, and he causes and drives repentance in us. So where it crosses the line to damnation in any given time is if we continually, persistently reject the work of God's Holy Spirit, which is to convict us of these things. Okay? Does that help? That's a long answer. Mary Lou is going to give me... They're always long. <laughs> All right. So back to the case at hand. He didn't, he didn't get me too far off track. People in the New Testament era, post-Christ, okay, we're saved through faith in Christ, through looking at Christ and who he is, he's son of God, and what he's come to do. He's come to be the sin bearer for the world. So he's died for us and subsequently risen from the dead. And all who are baptized into him, who don't reject the, the Holy Spirit's work in them, will be saved like him. They will be resurrected like him. And though they die, just like the patriarchs before, yet shall they live. Present slash future indicative. It's going to happen. It indicates something, right? How are Old Testament people saved? The same way. In what way was that? Eyes looking towards a Messiah who is yet to come. Okay? Now, the difference between a modern Jew, ethnic religious Jew, who um, and a patriarch, for instance, is one of the patriarchs looked for God's salvation through a sent Messiah who came. And their belief was in the true Messiah who came. What about a Jew who lives today, ethnic religious Jew who lives today, and they look on Jesus, but they don't acknowledge him as the Messiah? See, there's the difference between an ethnic religious Jew of today versus a patriarch of old. Well, if you look, that's what their religion yeah, yeah, is still waiting for the Messiah to come and who was going to restore them to their glory, to the original glory of Israel. Yeah. But then what? what is the glory of Israel? So you're the new Israel nowadays. So nowadays, right? You are living as the new Israel and the glory will be restored, but it's God's glory. It's not their glory. Right, so I'm just thinking, what, were, what are they thinking? So, so here's what I would offer, not knowing, not being you know, an ethnic religious Jew who would be in on the inside track on this, but I would say that it was a, a misunderstanding, much like the numerous ones we see in the New Testament with the Jews who challenged Jesus, or the people who maybe even just wrongheadedly understood Jesus. So I've already mentioned you know, the feeding of the 5,000 here today. Well, what did the people want to do with Jesus after he fed them? They wanted to make him the king. Hey, this guy must be the right guy, because guess what he did? He made sure our bellies were full. He provided for us. And if you had any idea of you know, food scarcity back then, you'd understand that these people had a misunderstanding of who Jesus was as a king. Similarly, it's not just on a belly standpoint. I could say it could be like as a, in terms of Israel being a military might and power. You know, we're, we're in charge and everybody's subject to us. And that means that God's glory is manifested through us as his own special people. So maybe what they're thinking of is some kind of a, you know, some kind of self-glorification to which I would, I would buckle at both of those. And I would say the glory of God, what is the glory of God? The glory of God is to create a people for himself. Well, that makes more sense because then they would have been the rulers. I mean, still, there's still a stem on Yeah. Them. Still there being chosen by God. Yeah, and then they overrule the one true God. So I don't I don't know what it looks like in its you know exact form, but I would say that just as there was misunderstanding, misunder misinterpretation of who Jesus was in the time of Jesus, I would say similarly today that same misinterpretation, misunderstanding exists and manifests. Okay. Yeah, Susan. When our Jewish Well, that's where I say you may be surprised on that day. Yeah. 
Uh, but at the end, yeah, it sounds to me like confused. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, that's not so, what you say, Chuck, is not so far off base because I think there's people that, that they want to cover their bases. So I'll give you an example of this. I had a person that I came across over the years that has gone through kind of various iterations of Christianity. They were a non-Christian. They came into Christianity through Pentecostalism got dismayed with Pentecostalism, moved into reform teaching, did more reading, came to me one day out of the blue and wanted to know about our baptismal theology, became a Lutheran after I catechized them, and then moved away, and I got a note one day from them that they were starting RCIA classes at a Catholic church because they wanted to just keep getting closer to what was the real truth. And I'm like, (laughs) swing and a miss. (laughs) Um, I want to carry on just... Continue just a little bit, I know. A little bit from the commentary, and then we'll dive into what we got going here on the slides. Gibbs goes on, he says, To be sure, the Christ indicates elsewhere, although rarely and nowhere in Matthew's gospel, that there is an interim state of rest for the believer's soul when death has torn a human being asunder into two pieces. He gives a whole series of them in in footnotes. He says, for instance, Luke 23, verse 43, assumes a blessed post-mortem existence for those who look to Jesus for salvation. In addition, Luke 16, verses 19 to 31, assumes the same, although the details of this parable can't be pressed to discover information about the condition of being in Abraham's bosom. That's the story of Lazarus and the rich man and being carried to Abraham's bosom. He says, by the way, that Luke 16, 19, 31 is a parable is shown by the presence of other parables in the near prior context. And then he tells of that. And by the identical introductory clauses of this unit and the parable of the unjust steward. So we can't take the story of Lazarus and the rich man as the way that it's going to be, is basically what he's saying, because it was a parable. Okay? So that's why we don't cling to that and say, that's exactly what it's going to look like. We're going to be in heaven and we can't see hell, but everyone in hell is going to see us. No. The fact is, what the scriptures say is that those who go into the place that we're going to eventually call true hell, which is separation from God, this, this lake of burning sulfur and fire spoken of in, in Revelation 21, that's out of the presence of God. So if heaven is the place where the presence of God is with his people, well, then people that are in true hell are separated from that and have no vision on that. That's what's going to make it such a terrifying and terrible place and why you should not want to be there, right? So, back, that's out of the footnote. Um, This topic is not in view of the controversy with the Sadducees. Sadducees. The Lord highlights a fundamental declaration about the God of Israel. I am the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. And he combines that with his own assertion about the sort of God that the God of Israel is. In verse 32, he says, He's not the God of the dead, but he's the God of those who live. Thus, Jesus sets the Sadducees back on their heels, and he rejects their deadly error. This God, here's their deadly error. This God will surely raise the dead on the last day. Right, Sherry? Thank you. You guys know the joke? Regardless of how these Jewish leaders came to deny the resurrection of the body, with an unparalleled authority, Jesus teaches that such a hope of the resurrection of the dead a future hope is implied already in Yahweh's appearance to Moses at the burning bush. He's not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They're dead now, but guess what? They're going to live. And you even get a glimpse of it. That's where I thought this was pretty cool because it intersected the question that the member had of me. What about Moses and Elijah that were present there with Jesus On the mountain, was it them in bodily form, body and soul rejoined? What was it? It's that's sort of my answer. It's not body and soul, but that's where I was clinging to this idea that I shared with you know Amy's grandpa. Seeing somebody that is familiar, can God allow us to have that type of vision? Absolutely, can. Now, the last thing out of this commentary is he's got a section right at the end, which really fits what we're doing right here. It says, hope at funerals. 
And I wanted to read this too, because I think it's good. He says, I might also here offer a brief encouragement to Christian pastors that preach at funerals. As much as you or I would like to offer complete comfort in the face of death, we simply cannot do such a thing. For the complete removal of grief and tears is still yet to come. Yes, you can offer the assurance that a dead believer is not separated from Christ's love, and in some true but unclear sense is in paradise, in the presence of Christ, according to Luke 23, 43. They are free from fear and temptation to fall from faith and thereby forfeit salvation through such falling. In some ways, this is far better than the present mortal existence where we still live. As Paul declares in Philippians 1.23, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Nevertheless, death remains a grim reality, the sign that the day has not yet come for God's will to fully be done on earth as in heaven. Not yet, anyway. The remedy for death is resurrection from the dead. The great hope to be proclaimed at a Christian funeral is the promise that the day will surely come. <laughs> when all the dead will be raised and believers will live in the fullness of the eternal, immortal life spoken of in Matthew twenty-five forty-six. The liturgical blessing that happens at graveside says it well. I commend it to all of my readers. And this is right out of the Lutheran propers. I just did a funeral yesterday, but I didn't do a graveside with it. But this is exactly what we would read. We now commit the body of our brother or sister and their name to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will change our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subdue all things to himself. May God the Father who created this body, may God the Son who by his blood redeemed this body, may God the Holy Spirit who by holy baptism sanctified this body to be his temple, keep these remains to the day of the resurrection of all flesh. Amen. As for the very small but practical matter of what to place on a Christian headstone in a cemetery, a simple addition to a common phrase would speak great and unexpected hope to all who pass by. Rest in peace, rise in glory. Now, he would tell you, if, if he were standing in front of you, he's already got his epitaph picked out for his headstone. To be continued. <laughs> so I thought it was kind of fun that while we're on the subject of marriage, that there, there will neither be people married nor given in marriage in heaven, that we intersected Moses, that Jesus employs. And you guys know when you do interpretation, you got to understand what Jesus just did with the, fair, with the Sadducees in that scene right there. Is he took an Old Testament text and he interpreted it, interpreted it, 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 had a little stutter there. He interpreted it to them so that they could see the truth of what's going on. He took scripture and he interpreted it right in front of them so that they could see the truth of what's going on. That I am the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. I'm the God of your forefathers. They're dead, but they're not dead because they had hope in me who was to come. And just like I'll die, I'll rise again from the dead. And just like everyone who's in me, they'll rise again from the dead. So we get to live and say, like Paul says, for me to live as Christ, to die as gain, because what we know is that death can't touch us. And unlike the, the, um, the atheist who would say, well, death is just the absence of what's going on around us, we're going to have an awareness. We got the inside track. I mean, it's, it's incredible to know that we already know that we live, that death can't touch me. So Luther was well aware of this stuff. Luther, it's in some of the footnotes that I didn't pick any of this out and share any of those with you. I did enough reading to you. But Luther, um, you know, when he learned that he was under papal bull of excommunication, right? So the Pope said, this guy's a heretic. He's got to die. And anybody that found Luther could kill him, and they would be doing a favor to the church. And the way that they would kill him would be to behead him. So Luther told of this, you know, hey, we got to do something. Make sure that you're safe, Luther. And he's like, <laughs> who cares? Let them take my head. The Lord will give me another in the resurrection. Because he knew that he already lived. He knew that he was alive. And that's the, that's the Christian 
in very much Lutheran faith that we profess is for me to live as Christ to die as gain. And as I've told you, I'm a whole lot better husband, father, pastor, you know, whatever, neighbor, um, alive than I am dead. I'm more useful alive than dead. So what's the natural answer that I would have to give just like Paul? I'd rather be alive than dead. This is what God created me to be, was alive. Body and soul joined together. To die, you know, to die would be to have that not be the way that God intended it. Which is why when he sets things right, he puts the bodies and the souls back together in the resurrection of the dead. And that's the day when the last enemy to be destroyed, this is 1 Corinthians 15, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. It's not destroyed yet. You guys get that? That's why we're still dealing with ones that we love who have died. Because the last enemy is not yet destroyed. But he's said that it's going to happen, and I believe it. He's the first proof of it. Okay, So until that day comes, we're going to mourn. And I think that's the point that he makes neatly in that last little bit right there. It's going to sting when somebody that we love dies. There's going to be tears. And I don't look forward to going through it because as we go through it, we're going to learn that death was a punishment for sin. So to, to, for us to go along sort of you know, happily like, oh, well, I don't care if I live or I die. I actually really do care that the people that I love die. It hurts. Uh, if you've never tried to preach at a funeral, and I bet there's only a few in the room, maybe one other in the room right now that has preached at a funeral. <coughs> Good hair pastor. It, when you have to do it for people that you love dearly, it's hard. I don't care what you say. Even if you know that they're people in the faith. It's no fun. And I certainly don't look forward to it with you know, people that are ultimately the closest to me, family members or anything like that. So the true marriage, and I, we, I'll finish this point, the true marriage that will occur is that Christ, the bridegroom, will now ultimately be married and in union, full unity with his bride, which is the church. And, you know, I've heard the objections that, oh, this isn't manly enough talk, and this is why there's not more men in the church and why you get more women in the church than there are men, because, you know, the church has sort of this effeminate, you know, thing, and even the music in modern contemporary churches is sort of effeminate and, you know, like, oh, Jesus, I love you, I give my heart to you, and all this, you know, the refrains that they sing, and I sort of have a heart for that. So I'm careful, you know, when we talk about us being the bride of Christ, you know, that, that the men around the room can't, aren't free to be manly. <laughs> well, I think that's sort of dumb because I have men friends that I'm, in fact, one of them's coming this week, a guy that was my best friend in seminary. They're coming to stay with us for the weekend. They'll be with us at least for church. I don't know if they'll stick around for Bible study next week, but he's since left the ministry and gone back to his old first career, but still serves a church on the side. So he calls it sort of like Paul as tent maker ministry, but he's probably one of my best friends in the world. And um, I know what it's like to love this guy like a brother or more than a brother. And I don't feel less manly for it. In fact, I think our God created the emotions that we experience. And in fact, lived in the emotions that we experience. So for us to fully embrace our manhood, and I'm not just talking to, you know, men, you know, Tim, T to tool man, Taylor, you know, not that kind. I'm talking our humanity as mankind. So this includes women too. When I say in our fullness of our humanity and our manhood that God has bestowed upon us includes uh, embracing the emotions that God equipped us with. So I'm free, won by Christ already. I'm free to tell another guy, I love you. Or to give him a hug and say, you know what, I miss you. I haven't seen him. I mean, I saw him last summer when we went to Houston for the uh, robotics finals. But I hadn't seen him for 10 years before that. And that's too long. We agreed it was too long. As good of friends as we were, and we let, you know, pastors don't get to go travel on the weekends like a lot of people do. And there's getting to be fewer and fewer of us. And so the work it never ends. And it usually ends up, you know, we get stuck in a routine of work, 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 and we never take time to do these things. And then 10 years is gone and you didn't even realize it. And I think we both realized it, that we don't want to let time get away. We love each other too much to let the time and the distance separate us. 
Um, I think it's okay to in, enjoy some time together. I think it's okay to mourn together with people. It's okay to have a tear once in a while or to get choked up in front of people. And I hate doing it in front of church. You know, like if I'm doing a funeral for somebody that's a member here, and I've done it since I've been here with people that I love dearly and I've had a hard time getting through stuff. And my wife especially hates it. I hate when you stand up there and you blubber. And I'm like, I'm, I don't like it any more than you do. And I don't have anywhere to run and hide. Right? I think the reason she hates it is because she, she doesn't like to see me do that. I'm supposed to be the one that stays strong and gets us through this and has something to say about stuff. So I get where she's coming from. Um, let's talk for a minute uh, about what the resurrection looks like in only a few minutes here. Emmanuel. Um, Imanu, or so El, the Hebrew word El, is God. That's God in the Hebrew. So Im is my, Manu is with. So in the Hebrew, Imanu El is God with us. This is who Jesus is. So for some people, it might be like, well, what do you mean God with us? Because he's already with us. But I don't know about the rest of you. Sometimes it's frustrating for me to think, you know, I always ask the kids in confirmation, can you talk to God? So I'll ask you guys, can you talk to God? Yeah, yeah how? You talk in prayer, you, and it's, I always say it's sort of organic for me. I just, once in a while, I'll just start talking as if he's sitting right next to me, because he is, right? But it's a little unfulfilling, isn't it, once in a while? What's so unfulfilling about it? Yeah, I, you know, I quite prefer, so last weekend, Amy and the kids are gone, you know, and uh, as much as I can't believe I'm about to say this, <laughs> no, I mean, not that I missed her, I did miss her, I can say that okay, but, you know, sometimes I don't like when she hogs the bed and I have to sleep on this little sliver of the bed. I had the whole bed to myself for a couple of days, and I, it was glorious for a day, but then... But then when it was kind of cold at night, I'm like, oh, I, I sort of wish I could just kind of <laughs> spoon in right there and warm up, right? And I, I missed her. I missed the presence, the feeling, the ability to touch her. And I think in a way, you know, you think that's a marriage. So if God describes the bridegroom as Christ and we're the bride, the church, that, you know, just like in a marriage where you can miss a spouse like that, and some of you know this very real, in a real sense, because you're widowers and you've had to go through this. And, and um, I, don't, I don't long for that day because I think that's going to be a terrible thing to have to endure. And that's why I say there's still room for tears in all of this and, and sadness in this, but there's also room for joy knowing that there comes a time when the Lord has in store for us a time when we will be renewed and restored and together and, and have the, the gift of the comfort of touch and of face to face. Now, it doesn't mean that God can't talk to us because just as we can talk to God in prayer, how does God speak to us? Through the word, through scripture, through the heard word. So last thing, because then I can take a shot at my mother-in-law from the from the front, and she's not here to defend herself either. What a jerk of a son-in-law, right? This is years ago, and it's unrelated, but it's related in my mind, so I'm going to share it with you. Um, she said to me one day, she goes, I don't need you to forgive my sins. We're talking about um, individual confession and absolution, right? And she's sort of, she's Lutheran, the sort of anti-Catholic Lutheran thing, and I'm like, let that go. You know, we need to let that stuff go. But she's like, I don't need to go do private confession and absolution. We've been talking about it. I don't need to go tell you my sins to have them forgiven. I can pray about it and know that God has forgiven them. So what she was saying was she can go to her room and pray in private and quiet. Maybe her prayers before bed, Lord, forgive me the sins I've committed today. And I can know that they're forgiven. And I'm like, what do you guys think of that? You think you're okay with that? You probably know that I'm about to shoot it down too. <laughs> I'm okay with that. You can do that. But what I told her was, I said, you know, your daughter, your daughter I love. And I love when she tells me that she loves me. I love to hear it. She can tell me a thousand times a day. She told me before I left to come to church today, she kissed me. And as she's still laying in the bed, she kissed me. I walked out the door, said, I'm heading to church. And she said, I love you. And I said, I love you too. And I can hear it a thousand times a day. It doesn't matter. If I hear a thousand and one, I'm still happy to hear it that extra time. 
And I said, what's the problem when you pray to God? You have to know it, but what do you miss? You don't get to literally hear it. So when you go to church and you hear the word of God and you hear what Jesus has done for you and you hear, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, I forgive you your sins, you get to hear God's proclamation spoken to you that the sins are forgiven. And so I asked her, I said, why do you think if, if God doesn't need a pastor to proclaim this word, then why did God establish the pastoral office? And why do you want to nullify it and say, hey, I don't need it. I can just pray about it. Well, you don't even need church then. You see what's going, you see the problem that sort of spills out from it? And I said, just as much as I want to hear that I'm loved by my wife, I want to hear that I'm loved by my God, which is really the goal of the church week in and week out is to remind people of God's love for them in spite of their sins. So the gospel changes people. The law will always accuse us. And the gospel is what should be getting proclaimed in the churches. And it should be God's I love you that he speaks to us. Okay. You're going to talk about a mother-in-law? <laughs> Address unknown. <laughs> All right. Well, I better call it off. I got to carry on with services. All right. Have a blessed day and week in the Lord, guys.